wonderful thing when we, when we think of that happy day, isn't it? When Jesus washed our sins away. We'll just bow together for a word of prayer. Nice to see everyone here tonight. Thanks again for coming uh, to the Bible study and the prayer meeting. And we do remember the Holiday Bible Club uh, especially uh, in these days. And we remember the, the youth meeting going on uh, tonight afresh. So we'll bring them before the Lord in prayer and just commit ourselves uh, tonight as well to the Lord. Let's pray. Our loving and our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can truly say this is the day the Lord has made, that we can rejoice and we can be glad in it. And we thank you for each and every head that's bowed here in your presence tonight. And Lord, the reason we're here is to worship and to praise your wonderful name. Lord, we're here to speak to you and we're here for you to speak to us. And we just pray, Lord, afresh tonight that you will truly just open up the floodgates of heaven. And pour out a blessing upon us. As we looked around today. We saw the beauty of your creation. We saw the sun shining. And Lord we could say that it was good to be alive. But yet as we thought about much to do with nature and creation. We thought that we worship and we praise the through creator God. You tell us in your word that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The sea and all that is therein and lord as we come before you tonight we worship the god of power the god of authority the god who spoke this world into existence the god who created us male and female and the god who sustains life in us each and every day and we come before you tonight thanking you for all that you mean to us tonight and for all that you do for us even as we look upon the last few days and the last week even since we met here last we can say great is your faithfulness to us we can say count our many blessings and we can name them one by one. And Lord, even as we look back upon the last week of Holiday Bible Club, we thank you for your wonderful hand upon us. We thank you for your speaking voice to those young hearts and young lives. And we thank you, Lord, for the parents bringing them in. We thank you for the boys and girls and for all the leaders and for everyone who's a part to play in it. And Lord, we look to you for great things even tomorrow as we finish off. We thank you, Lord, for the youth meeting tonight. We pray, Lord, you'll go before the one, who, especially Paul there, who will bring the word. We pray, Lord, may it just be a word in season. And, Lord, we long just for those young hearts and lives to be touched. And, Lord, to see so many in tonight there gathering just fellowship together and in under the sound of your word we thank you for the tremendous gospel message we're going to look at tonight a little later on in our bible study we thank you for for your salvation so rich and so wonderfully free so lord bless us tonight as we meet around your word draw us close to your word and lord not only that as we spend time in prayer together lord that you will lead guide and wonderfully direct our time of prayer. We've much to pray for. We've many to pray for. And we're looking to you, Lord, to answer prayer in these days. We don't want to go through the motions as we, we often say of services just for the sake of having services. But we want services that are owned of yourself. We want times together where, where we come and we know you're in the midst. And Lord, we know you're going to bless. So Lord, we long to pray through tonight. And we long, Lord, that in our land in these days, that you will answer prayer because we ask it in your lovely name amen amen folks if you have your bibles with your uh, on your phones whichever you do uh psalm 4 uh just at the beginning of the psalms there um we know that psalm 3 4 and 5 uh, are psalms that are all together uh one of my favorite psalms is psalm 5 it's a wonderful psalm of prayer and uh psalm 3 4 and 5 uh, they all go together in a particular period and difficult period in the life of David. So we're going to take time to read uh, the eight verses of Psalm 4 together. We're just looking at the little thought of salvation. Now I know sometimes in the Old Testament it can be a little different than what we look at in the New Testament. And uh, we're just going to look at David's words here. And yet the words we take in the Old Testament are the very same words that we do use when it comes to salvation in uh, the New Testament. So let's read this wonderful uh, psalm together. Psalm 4, and I'll read a verse or two, and then folks do read, and uh, just one after the other, and we get through to the end of this psalm. Psalm 4 and verse 1 says, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me, and hear my prayer. 
O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing? Selah. Verse 3. <clears throat> know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself, and the Lord will hear when I call to him. which we'll finish there at the end of uh, verse 8 uh, together. Uh, you'll see to the chief musician of Negamo uh, and it's titled the Psalm of David. And this was a psalm uh, that David wrote in a very difficult period and a very difficult time in his life. And sometimes you, you, we will find it very hard to even think of the particular situation that David was in because they say Psalm 3, Psalm 4 and Psalm 5 was written in a time when David was on the run or fleeing from his own son Absalom. And you never think you come to the point where you'd have to flee from your own son. We think the king of the land, Absalom, wanted to take over the throne and he put David off the throne and he would have taken David's life at that particular time. And I often think of David, you know, we talk about David, a man after God's own heart. We talk about all the wonderful things David did as king. But yet, when you look through the life of David, there was a lot of difficulties, there were a lot of problems, there was a lot of trials, there was a lot of tribulations in his life. And no matter how, how good a Christian is, no matter how, how well they live a life for the Lord, it doesn't mean that they won't have trials or they won't have tribulations or they won't have difficulties as they go through life. And David is no different. He had to flee for his own life and he had to flee from his son Absalom. David was driven out of his inheritance and we know that David was king and he was anointed king and, and then after him Absalom was supposed to reign but then Absalom wanted to reign early. But David knew that his inheritance was spiritual and not material. And I think that's a wonderful thing for the man or woman of God to realize that, that our inheritance is spiritual and it's not material. That our, our treasure is stored up in heaven. And that's the one thing Absalom never realized because he wanted in his inheritance on this earth. But he didn't realize that his father David knew that his inheritance was above and not beneath. David wanted to be king. David was a good king because he realized his true inheritance was in the Lord. And we have to come to that place in our lives that we realize our true inheritance is in the Lord. And one of the hymns I always go to that we learned when we're young is, this is not my home. I'm only passing through. And that's when we realize our inheritance is not here, but our inheritance is heaven and our inheritance is home. Psalm 3, I said Psalm 4, and Psalm 5 is, is a liturgy of Psalms. Many will say uh, that Psalm 3, David, what was his first prayer that he wrote uh, the day before, and, and then the day after was Psalm 4 in the morning was his next prayer, and then Psalm 5 was, was the third morning, and then he went out into battle. Now, Psalm 4 was written at a lull in the period. In other words, Absalom had placed him off the throne. Uh, David was on the run. David was in hiding. But Absalom should, if he wanted to have won the battle, he should have gone after David, but he stopped and he didn't. And he missed his opportunity. And in the middle of that lull, David got time to think. David got time to pray. David got time to gather before God. And David got time to gather an army together. And, and the wonderful little thought here is David gets before God. And he asks for God to come. And he asks for God to meet afresh with him. And, you know, it's a great message for us today. No matter what we're going through in life, we can do the same as David. Get time alone with God. No matter what's behind us, no matter what's ahead of us, 
it's always good to get alone with God. It's always good to come before God. And it's always good to, to call out to God, as it says right in the very beginning. Because David wanted to make sure that God was going to hear him. And we know that sometimes in our lives, when we get to a difficult point or a difficult stage or, or maybe a purpose where we don't know which way to turn, it's good to be able to cry out. And it's good to be able to call upon God. And he's making sure that God hears him. There in verse 1 he says, hear me when I call. And those are definite words. He's not, he's not, this is not a question, will you hear me when I call? This is definite, hear me when I call. O oh God of my righteousness. The, David realized there was no, nothing righteous in him. There was no goodness in him. There was no holiness in him. Everything he had came from God and from God alone. And, and that's the point we all have to get to in our lives and our experience, realizing everything we have and everything we are comes from God and comes from God alone. It's my God. We could go in and we could look at the word my, the Lord is my shepherd. Many times throughout the Psalms, David quoted my Lord, my God, my King. It, it was something that was personal. And, and the little thought I want to bring tonight in verses 1 and 2 is really to do with, with the thought of salvation. There in verses 1 and 2, the, the salvation that David had in mind was really salvation from difficult times and difficult things. But the point I want to bring out of this before we go into anything else was that, that, that we can trust in God for salvation from sin because salvation is something that is personal. And there's two little thoughts here before us tonight very quickly. The first thing is David spoke about a personal salvation. He didn't speak about a practical salvation just, but he spoke about a personal salvation first. And I think that's where every single one of us have to get, don't we? That we get to the personal place of salvation. And that's the wonderful thing for us as we gather here together tonight. And I've known everyone here for, for many, many years. And I know because I've heard you give a testimony and I've heard you speak that, that you have a personal salvation. That you know the Lord Jesus Christ personally. And folks, that is the reality. And David knew the Lord personally. He said, hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Every bit of righteousness, every bit of cleanliness, every bit of godliness within him came directly from God. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. And he talked about the difficulty times that he was going through. And, and, and what I thought about that was that, folks, if, if we're not for Christ, we're against Christ. There's no middle ground. That's the sad reality. We're either for him or we're against him. And you know the distress of those who are against God. No matter how they try to live their life. No matter how they try to do right. No matter how they try to do good. You never can because you're against God. You're not with God. You're not his child. You're his enemy. That's the reality and that's what scripture says. But here in this little portion, he said, Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. And here he says, Thou hast, thou hast dealt with me. And sometimes I believe that the reality is, and I was talking about it with someone there a, a while back, and they said to me, you know, they said, Mervyn, you have to come to the place you realize you're a sinner before you can ever come to the place you need to be saved. And sometimes people say, and realize that they need to be saved. But they never come to the point where they realize they're a sinner. And I remember in Bible college over all the years, they, they always taught us the verses, listen, you when you're counseling someone, when you're speaking to someone, they have to realize they've sinned. And you know that, that little verse in Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see, you'll never realize your need of salvation until you realize that you've sinned. And that's why David realized he was in distress. He realized he was in his sin here. And he goes on to say, have mercy upon me. And it's really, isn't that the sinner's prayer? They're crying out to God for mercy. That's the kindness. That's the love. That's the benevolence of God that he has showed. We, we, we know that lovely hymn, mercy there was great. Grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me at Calvary. And he not only asked for the mercy of God to be upon him, but he asked, Lord, hear my prayer. 
And that's the cry of, 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 of every person when they come to realize that they're a sinner. They cry out to God for mercy. They pray to him and they ask for forgiveness. And he comes in and he saves them. That's a personal salvation. You know, the reality is many times, and I don't know whether it's, it's a pastoral thing or something, but there's many people come to me and they tell me all that they believe. Now, as you know, as you've heard me saying on many occasions, I ask them where they get it. Oh, I, I just think it. You know, and I'm going, okay, you, you can think it, but, but where does it come from? But you know, a lot of them that think this is right and think that will get them to heaven, they never ever talk about being a sinner. And if you bring them to the point that the scripture says, listen, we've sinned, they don't grasp that. So they never grasp their true need of salvation. One of the thoughts I was thinking about there during the week about a personal salvation was the Philippian jailer. See, he never realized his need. He had Paul and Silas in, in the middle of the prison. And when he got to the place of distress, like we're looking at here, when he got to the place of difficulty, when he realized the prison doors were open and that Paul and Silas were going to come out, remember it says there in, in verse 29, he came trembling. That man was in distress. I said he was going to take his own life, but they told him, don't harm yourself. We're, we're still here. And then he cried out those words. He said, what must I do to be saved? And those are the words that, that every sinner has to cry out, isn't it? And they answered the words there in verse 31. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. We've come to that point, haven't we? That's a personal salvation. I read a little story there, a little illustration. And you know, I must admit, I had to sit for a long time and ponder it over. And I even had to go out and leave and ponder it over in my own heart. Because the story was told of two men on the beach. And he said one man was sitting there and he was, he, well he was lying back and he was enjoying the sun. Like something you were maybe doing today, I don't know. But he was soaking up the sun. The other man, he got on the swimming trunks and he went into the water. And he decided he was going to have a wee paddle about to himself and he was going to enjoy himself. Anybody like a wee bit paddling about when they're at the sea? Colder, yeah? He's not going to even answer me tonight in case I put it up on this. Walter said he loves a wee bit of paddling by the sea. But, you know, he went on in a wee bit. But, you know, sometimes, especially out far, and if you, if you go out a certain distance, then there's a big drop. And this boy went out a little distance, and he kept walking and walking. He thought he was safe, but he got to the point where he dropped off the end. And the, and the, and the, the fella, he was, he, he was sinking. He wasn't able to swim, and he was going down. And he shouted out, help, help. I can't swim. And, and the other man looked across. And he looked at him for a while. He, and he says, look, he says, neither can I. But I don't make a fuss out of it. And I thought to myself, you know, it's a funny little story. But yet the point the man was making. One man knew he was lost. The other man didn't. One man realized his lost state, and the other man didn't. And you know, I believe there's not one person that can be saved unless they realize their lost state and cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. That's where we got to. And folks, I'm just dealing with that tonight, and I know I'm preaching to the converted here, please don't get me wrong, but sometimes we have to realize that when it comes to speaking to people. They can be very good people. They can be churchy people. They can have lived a good life. They can have all their ideas. But unless we can get them to the point that they realize they're a sinner and need to be saved, they have no hope. You see, here in this, David cried out, have mercy upon me, save me. That's the sinner's prayer. Have mercy upon me and save me. Me. The second little thought here, folks, very quickly, uh, I shouldn't be going into it, but it's just a practical salvation. There in verse 2, David said, O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing? And there in verse 2, David wanted his salvation to be thorough. 
He wanted to be complete. He wanted it to be a beyond question. He wanted to live a, a godly life in front of everybody that was looking on. And folks, not only is our salvation to be personal, but it has to be practical. It has to be lived out. And that's what David was saying here. Look, how long? How long will you love vanity? How long will you seek after leasing? You look at all these other things. But I want you to look at my life and see the way I'm living my life. I'm sure, like me, many people have come to you and they have said, well, they're not much of a Christian. Now, if they haven't done it to you, they've done it to me on many occasions. And they've said, you know, they're not living their life the way they should be living it. And David here was saying, listen, look, I want to not only have a personal salvation, but he said, I want to have a practical one as well. I want others to know that I am saved. Very quickly, folks, I, I want to read out the life story of a man by the name of George Mueller. And I'm sure maybe many of you have, have, have heard of his life and, and read of his life. But George Mueller was, was, was I suppose, a very, a very difficult character in, in his early life. And if you ever read of George Mueller, you would see that there was anything but Christianity lived out in his life when, when he was a young man. George Muller became, uh, I, I suppose, was born in Bristol. And before he was, he was 10 years of age, he was an accomplished thief. You know, he, he stole everything he needed. And he could lift anything without anybody even seeing or knowing. The night his mother died, they said he was wandering the streets and he was drunk. And they said he was so drunk that he didn't even know where he was going along the street or that his mother had actually died. Uh, they went on to say that he disgraced himself in one school after another. He was expelled from it. He eventually went to the school of divinity for training ministers. And I oft, uh, when I read the story of George Muller, I thought, well, how do you get from, from, from there and being expelled from so many different schools to go to, to train for the ministry or why you would ever get there? But, you know, he thought there was plenty of money in it. I don't know where he thought that from, but he thought that from, and he thought he would get plenty of money out of it. So he thought he would go there. And he was no better there. He constantly was in debt, and every type, type way and every way he could do it, he tried to get, to get money. He would sell prayers, he would sell different things. That was in any way to get money. He tried to reform himself, but in, in his book you'll read, he wasn't able. Then God wonderfully met with him. And God wonderfully saved him. And he changed his life completely around. And he gave him a true ministry. What George Muller wanted to do and longed to do was many of you who've read his life story will know that he wanted to open a group of orphanage homes. And when he was open them, he, would, he wanted to show that God was real to the people around. He opened them and he prayed in every single bit of funding. Many mornings they wouldn't have even had enough for breakfast. And he'd have prayed the bread rolls in. The baker who was going past or the man delivering would have dropped in rolls or dropped in milk or dropped in something when they were going past. He had nothing, but he prayed it all in. He never asked for anything. He just prayed everything in. And I want to leave you with two just quotations that was left at his death. The Bristol Times said, Mr. Mueller was raised up to show us that the age of miracles is not past. That's what he showed them. And then the, uh, Professor Rindle Short said this, a surgeon, he said, my father used to say that during the days of George Mueller's, uh, he says, antagonism and agnosticism did not dare to raise its head in Bristol. And he went on to give a list of things that happened. But this is what he said. He said there that in Bristol, the whole town went into mourning when he died. The shops closed. Businesses closed. And he said the streets of the town lined. And they said the most faithful, godly man in Bristol has died today. 
See, that to me is practical Christianity. You see, it's personal, we know Christ, but then it's practical, we live it out. I folks, we'll finish there just at the end of that verse 2, and we'll look at another bit as we go along another night. Let's bow for prayer and we'll finish this part. Our loving and our gracious Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again tonight that we can gather together. Uh, we do thank you for your word. And Lord, we pray as we just go down to prayer here. And Lord, maybe those at home as well will go down to prayer. Lord, that you will come in amongst us in a mighty and in a powerful way. We thank you you're a God who hears. And you're a God who wonderfully answers prayer. You're a God who says before we even call, you will answer. And Lord, we, help you, we pray just in these days that you will help us to have that personal salvation that we're looking at tonight. And not only to have a personal salvation, but also to have a practical one. That we live it out each and every day of our lives. And that everyone around will know that we belong to the Lord Jesus. We pray now, Lord, you'll just go before us now into the time of prayer. Have your own way amongst us. Because it's in your lovely name we ask it. Amen.